Q&A time. Let's get started. Thoughts on the McGregor versus Habib fight? Well, it's certainly interesting, and apparently it's the biggest fight in the history of the UFC. So I'm looking really forward to seeing it myself. I know there's a lot of hype around it, but hey, this is going to be a damn good fight. So I'm not going to say who I'm rooting for, but I want to know from you. Who do you think is going to win and why? The way I see it, if Habib gets McGregor on the ground, there's going to be a problem. But if they're standing up, things are a little bit different. And there's other factors to consider as well, like Habib is 26-0, apparently never even lost a single round, which is pretty crazy if you ask me. But hey, who do you think is going to win? Instead of me talking, let's hear it from you. My question is regarding a video on the dead bench, but applying it to other lifts such as dead stop dips, how would you set up for this? I know it's doable. Essentially, you would start at the bottom. Make sure that your chain is long enough so that when you're in that deep position, it's basically resting on the ground, the weight plates. Another option is to put the weight on top of blocks. You can even do this for weighted pull-ups, by the way. You know my little setup that I got with the wood? Something like that. That would work pretty well if you're doing dead stop pull-ups. Although, if you're hanging from the bottom, like pull-ups already start from the bottom, so it's not like you're getting much out of it anyway. So that's one thing to consider. As far as the overhead press is concerned, super easy stuff. Exact same procedure, you're starting dead stop from the bottom, from the pins, okay? Instead of unracking from the top and lowering it, no. Bottom, dead stop. Same thing for the squats. Paul Anderson used to do this a lot. I mean, it's actually really, really simple. Just start from the bottom position using the low pins. There's your dead variation. I'm about 30% body fat and just started lifting. Should I eat at maintenance or a deficit to lose fat? Looking again to the high teens percentage. Well, if you just started lifting, you're a complete beginner. You're going to make gains regardless of your diet. And if you're 30% body fat, even easier. So I would say go into a calorie deficit. You want to be high teens, like what? 18% body fat? Totally doable. Totally, totally, totally. So eat in a calorie deficit. Lose that weight. You're going to gain strength and size. No problem. Now, if you're trying to get like stupid lean, maybe like 10% body fat, well, things will have to change a little bit. But as a novice who's 30% trying to get high teens, you're not going to have any problems with man, okay? For intensity days, does that mean go heavy with low reps on our accessories as well? Will that actually have strength carryover? Yeah, that's highly recommended. It's the best way to do it. Leave your intensity days for intensity work, heavy stuff, volume days, volume work. Now, there are some little exceptions here and there. Like if you're doing a band face pull, you don't have to do reps at 10 if you don't want to. Although I would say that's optimal for an intensity day. You can do reps at 20 though if you want. Certain accessories, it's more passable to do higher reps because it's not really that stressful in the body. And I think that in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to interfere with the adaptations that much. If it's a little accessory, just fluff work, then okay, fine. Like I'll do band rows for reps of 15 to 20 on my intensity days. I wouldn't do that on a barbell row. I would do reps of 5 or 10 max. So the way that I would put it is for the compound movements, you want it to be high percentage, low reps, okay? And for your accessories, that will be recommended as well. However, if you want to throw in a little bit of higher stuff, that can be done. You've seen me do this in my full body workouts many times, okay? So it is doable, but I wouldn't consider it optimal. Like, you will get better gains if you keep everything on the low rep range, okay? Do you have to test one rep max in order to get stronger? Well, it is not 100% mandatory. It's not required. But would I say that it is very valuable? Absolutely. In my opinion, the max effort method is the greatest strength training method of all time. If you do a lot of singles, you will get stupid strong. If you go balls to the wall, max effort, yes, you get very, very, very strong. So I recommend it. And I'm always using the max effort method. I credit that to a lot of my strength development, man. And with concurrent periodization, it's so easy to incorporate. You don't have to go through those blocks, those phases of starting at a low percentage and gradually working your way back up just so you could peak. I can max out year round, man. It's such a beautiful thing. Now, you don't have to max out at all if you don't want to. You don't, you don't even have to do the peaking process. You don't. If your goal is just size and gain general strength, you don't have to do that. Is it recommended though? Absolutely. If you want to get maximum strength, I highly recommend dwelling in the higher percentages, at least going to 90%, at least trying to three sets of one at 90. Like singles will get you strong. But if you're saying, do you have to test your one at max all the time? No, you don't. But do I recommend max effort method? You freaking bet. Oh yeah, max effort method will get you so strong. It's amazing. Thoughts on single arm band face bowls for some unilateral work and increased tension. It's actually a great lift. It's really, really, really good. You're not gonna get any impingement whatsoever. It's a natural movement. You can rotate the body. It looks a little bit weird but it does wonders for the rear delts and shoulder health. So yes, one arm band face pulls, excellent addition to your program. It'll also override 
the biological law of accommodation if you're concerned about that. You can do it for higher reps, lower reps. It's just another little tool that you can add. So if you don't want to increase the band tension or step further back, do it one arm at a time. You're going to get some serious results doing this. Absolutely. Hey, Alex, is it possible to hit a 500-pound deadlift on linear progression? I'm running a novice program at the moment at a 440 deadlift, and the gains aren't stopping. Well, look, man, it's certainly possible. Like, a lot of things are possible. And I'd say that for you, maybe. Like, I would say usually those who have really good leverages for deadlifts can pull this off. For me, the deadlift has always been my worst lift out of the big three. And my linear gains stopped on that lift before anything else. For me, the, the bench, I was able to prolong it the longest. Then squat was the second. But the deadlift, I tapped out pretty early. Like, nowhere close to where you hit. So... I would say keep going. You probably have potential. If the gains aren't stopping, you're running my novice program, you're already at 440. That's exceptional, dude. And I would say your potential is definitely up there for sure. So some people do hit a 500 pounds using linear progression. I would say it's rare. I would say it's going to be dependent upon your individual build. But if you happen to be one of those lucky guys, and it sounds to me like you are, you got a 440 here, still going strong, then hey, I would say it's definitely possible. Like probably realistic for you as well. So you have to factor in leverages here and i think you're one of those cases what do you think of low weight rack pulls is it worth it i only do 100 kilos for five deadlifts at the moment so i don't think i can put up crazy numbers for rack pulls yet like you always recommend well if you're only doing 100 kilos for five reps on the deadlift well you shouldn't be doing rack pulls in the first place build your base build your base man you have a lot more potential inside of you you can easily add like five kilos of workout to your pull from the ground so i would roll with that for now okay Build your base first, get your deadlift at least three plates minimum, and then start deciding if you want to include rack pulls. But I would say keep getting stronger the linear progression on pulls from the floor. It'll benefit you more than doing a rack pull below the knee for now. The only exception would be if you have a lower back issue or you just want to do it for whatever reason. That's that to answer your question. Can you get good gains with low weight rack pulls? Yes, you can. It's called using very high volume. Five sets of 20 with 30 to 60 second rest intervals. One set of 100, doing reps of 50, long holds. If you do enough volume, man, you're going to get a great workout. Do 50% of your one rep max, rack pull above the knee, doing one set of 100. This is for above the knee now. You're going to get great results. And if it's below the knee, you have tons of options. Try a snatch grip rack pull below the knee, doing a 5 by 20. It's very, very, very tough. I can try that out. Try 10 sets of 10, rack pull below the knee. You don't need crazy weights. That's something that I'm learning too. For my recent volume workout, I did 10 sets of 10 uh, snatch grip RDL with a deficit. And I was using 30 second rest intervals and I got a crazy workout for my hamstrings. I was only using 135. So you can get a great workout without going stupid heavy. It is totally doable, but man. Hey Alex, thoughts on doing rack pull below the knee, five by five, two times a week? Meh, it's doable, but it wouldn't be my preferred method. I don't really like rack pulls five by five twice a week i think one of those days should be done with like a three sets of one at 90 percent or five by one or even doing a max effort method i think you'll get better gains doing that so let's say monday you do a one rep max uh, snatch grip deadlift or one rep max uh, rack pull below the knee or three sets of one and then thursday you do the five by five below the knee i think you'll get better gains doing that personally okay and this will work for me in the past as well so you do what you want i wouldn't train like that but hey give it a shot I know it's going to be better than doing it off the floor. Certainly, I can guarantee you that much. If you're doing 5x5 five five twice a week from the floor, it's going to be way worse than if you're doing it below the knee in terms of recovery here. Could one set of bench every day not going to failure help me increase my chest size? I'm trying to bring up my chest. In the long run, that can probably benefit you, man. You're getting very high frequency. At the end of the week, you're getting seven sets of bench. Now, if progressive overload is taking place, you're not going to failure. Your ability to recover is just fine. Then, yeah, your chest will grow. But would I say it'll grow better than just some standard routine where you're benching maybe two or three times a week? Probably not. I think you might experience more neural adaptations. You'll gain more strength doing this, possibly if the recovery is not an issue. And I believe it would be problematic for the bench, at least, unless you're using a slingshot or doing it off the decline. But in my personal opinion, this is not feasible for a lot of people. There will be recovery problems. And I think you'll get similar results if you're benching two or three times a week. No problem. Twice a week, you're covered. One intensity day, one volume day, or even doing double volume, I think you'll be just fine. Especially on a pause bench, hitting some accessories like deep dumbbell presses, stuff like that. Like there are many ways to build your chest, even doing things like push-ups and dips. So I would not call this the holy grail of chest training whatsoever. I just see this as another method of getting a little bit stronger, maybe slightly faster progress, but you got to factor in the recovery times. 
What do you think of doing a triphasic program with concurrent? Three weeks concentric focus, three weeks eccentric, three weeks normal lifts. Well, I mean, I have no experience with this. I've never tried a program like this. Would it work? Possibly. The only thing that I don't like about it is the fact that it's three weeks where you're only doing like one style. Three weeks concentric only, three, three weeks negative, and three weeks a mixture. I think for carryover, it's probably not the best thing. I would instead recommend that you do it within the week itself. Maybe you can do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday setup, and each day is dedicated to a different form. So your intensity workouts could be concentric only, your volume workouts could be both, and then your light days can be just a negative or something. I don't know, something like that. I think you'll get more results if you combine it at the same time instead of doing these phases. It's kind of the same issue that guys have when they're doing block periodization where it's like, okay, this phase, I'm only going to go lighter. Now I'm going to go a heavy phase. Like, why not just combine it all into one? With concurrent, you have that capability. Like, you're able to do it. I think you'll get better carryover, probably better strength gains as well. It just makes more sense to me if you're going to try something like this. But again, I have no experience with what you're telling me. So those are just some little ideas to think about. But uh, try it out. Report back. Let me know if it works, man. On a three-day week concurrent setup, can you just alternate between volume and intensity day or do you have to do a light day? Well, you can you can definitely alternate between the two. I used to train like that a while back in the alpha body system, which is what came before naturally enhanced. It was 100% auto-regulated. Some days I would go heavy, some days I would go light. Sometimes it would be like two volume days in a row. Sometimes it would be two intensity days in a row. Or I would just be volume, intensity, volume, intensity, stuff like that. Or, or volume, light, and then I'm not going to dwell upon that too much. But you could train like that if you choose to. However, I will say this. Most people tend to make better gains with the heavy light medium setup. It's easier to manage and you can't screw it up as much. And you just know that, okay, this day it's heavy, this day it's light, this day it's, this day it's volume. If I'm talking about feasibility for most people who follow my work or people run my programs, that's what I would instead recommend. And just so you know, there is a template like that in Naturally Enhanced, a three day a week, um, heavy light medium. It works really well. So you can try that if you choose to, but to answer your question, yes, you could do the alternating method as well. Just realize that it's 100% auto-regulated and there is room for error. You could mess it up. You might have recovery problems, but if you can manage to go through that, you're rotating lifts, you're doing volume, intensity, volume, intensity, whatever. Hey, you're going to make serious gains. I can promise you that. I'm binging on my lean bulk. I'm a beginner, 152 pounds and six feet. Got any advice for me? My appetite is massive. Do you have a massive appetite? If you're only 152 pounds at six feet, I have a hard time believing that. So if you're telling me that you're binging on a lean bulk, given the information that you provided, I would say that's good news. Keep it up. Because you're only 152 pounds, right? How much weight are you gaining on a weekly basis? A pound a week? Okay, that's great. Yeah, definitely. Eat more food, but track your progress as well. If you notice that your weight is climbing up way too fast, then obviously dial it back a little bit. But... Personally, just off reading what you're telling me, I don't think you have a massive appetite. You probably think that you do, but you're eating less than you actually think. So if you're doing a clean bulk, you think that you're eating a lot, I, I don't know what to tell you. That's good. That's good news. Keep it up. But make sure that you're not overdoing it. Although I, I think you should be fine in this case. Would you recommend naturally enhanced for someone whose primary goal is hypertrophy? I would recommend naturally enhanced for anyone who wants to maximize their size in the neck traps, upper back, shoulders, forearms, and glutes. These are the six essential areas that it specifically targets. It's a specialization program for these muscle groups to make you appear absolutely massive using the illusion strategies, raising the body fat, etc. These are the areas which I can say will increase in size primarily. Other areas will improve as well, but not as much compared to the six that I just mentioned. On top of that, naturally enhances a general strength system. So your, your performance is going to improve all around, but not so specific to certain things, okay? So if you're looking for general strength, not being the jack of all trades, while simultaneously building your neck, traps, upper back, shoulders, forearms, and glutes, then naturally enhances the program for you. Plus, the original template is twice a week, although at the end of the book, there are different options. I include a three times, an upper lower, there's even a push-pull within the program itself. So there's different ways to structure it, but I recommend this program if you don't want to live in the gym, you want to build up the six essential areas. You want general strength. You want to learn more about programming general, concurrent periodization. And that's what I would say about that. What are your optimal nighttime snacks or meals for muscle building? Thoughts on fruit before bed as opposed to fats? Well, uh, depends what you ate throughout the day, man. But what I can say is that I really like smoothies at the end of the day. Like That's my go-to. I'll either have oatmeal, smoothies, or noodles. 
like noodles and broth. Like it's just a nice way of soothing the body. So you can eat whatever the hell you want, man. Like it depends what you ate throughout the day. Usually a nighttime snack for me will be around 800 calories. Another good one is broccoli and hummus or bread and hummus. Try that out. Whatever you're missing, just fill it up. I don't know what else to say besides that. It's just, it's common sense, you know? Adding fat grips to farmer walk candles, worth it overkill. Well, actual farmer walk candles are thick. Much thicker than I actually anticipated. So you probably don't need it for that. But if we're talking about adding fat grips to dumbbells or the trap bar, then it's totally worth it. Definitely, definitely worth it in that case. But in terms of the actual farmer walk implement, the official handles, you don't have to do that, man. Is dead benching eight sets of eight way too much? I've been doing this on my volume days. Well, eight sets of eight is definitely very effective. I'm a big fan of this myself, and a lot of old school bodybuilders talked about this as well. And Louis Simmons preaches the six by six, eight by eight, 10 by 10 method, which I've used as well with great success. So I like that setup. Now, in regards to dead benching, that's a low pin press because you're doing multiple repetitions. And as far as recovery is concerned, well, if you're not overdoing it, you should be okay. But I would say listen to your body. Like if you're doing eight sets of eight every single week, you're going to have recovery problems eventually. It's just going to, you're going to feel it. Overuse is going to kick in. I would not recommend that long term. But as a short term training cycle, like I said, the six by six, eight by eight, 10 by 10, it can be valuable, but don't overabuse it. Like I think you'd get better results doing a touch and go bench, eight by eight. Your recovery will be superior this way. So that's what I would personally advise, eight by eight touch and go, as opposed to eight by eight low pin press just for the recovery benefits, but try it out. If it's working for you, try it out, but please pay attention to your recovery. How to minimize elbow pain when doing lots of pin presses? Good question. First of all, don't over abuse them, okay? So try to rotate the variations as much as possible and like don't do it like every single freaking workout. Make sure that some workouts you're doing pause or touch and go, sometimes off pins. So not every single session should be a pin press. Secondly, if you have access to safety straps, that will do more for you in terms of recovery compared to just metal on metal. I'd also say that you should be controlling the negative. Don't just be slamming it down on the pins really hard. That's gonna beat up your joints a little bit more. Some people would also advise incorporating things like fat grips. Apparently that helps with elbow pain. I don't know how valid that is, but you can try it out. And then as a final solution, which is probably the most important, you're gonna wanna do a lot of band pushdowns and band curls at home. Do reps of 100, they can be done two to four times a week. Some people would even say every single day. So pump up your arms with the bands. That's going to help a lot in terms of preventing pain. And uh, you can even wear elbow sleeves when doing your benching workouts. I have hyper mobile elbows, okay? Yet I don't have any pain, okay? I can do extensions, I can do overload training, and I'm maxing out every single week. I'm always going heavy. A lot of the problems that people normally get following standard routines, I'm not getting. And I do a lot of pin pressing. So if you listen to this advice, I guarantee you that it's going to help. Wear sleeves and do your connective tissue work while rotating the variations. That's how you prevent the pain. Is it normal to bruise after doing zercher movements? Yeah, definitely. And it's normal to feel pain as well when you first start doing it. But eventually, you just you don't feel it that much, man. Like You can do your zerchers twice a week. Some people even do like Bulgarian routines on a zercher lift. It's like, I don't know why it does this, but it doesn't hurt as much after. Like I've loaded up 600 pounds in the zercher hold position. I, I didn't really feel like I was dying or anything. It was perfectly doable. Like once you're doing it for a long time, it's, it's very, it's fine. It really is. But if you're really concerned about it, I mean, you can wear elbow sleeves. You can wrap a towel around the barbell. But I'm telling you, it does get better with time. Uh, that said, I've had some people say that it's possible to get a hematoma doing zercher lifts. I don't know how true that is or not. Like I have no idea. And some people just bruise really easily, so... If that's you, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. But in terms of the actual pain itself, it tends to get better with time. Thoughts on incorporating strict curls as a main movement in multiple rep ranges to build size and strength? I think that is a fantastic idea, my friend. I would much rather you do this instead of a weighted chin up. Take it from people like me who have terrible arm genetics. Use a strict curl as your main bicep builder. You can do one day intensity, one day volume, rotating the sets and reps, percentages, variations of the strict curl as well. Maybe one week close, one week wide, using fat grips, no fat grips, pausing, non-pausing. I think this is a great idea, and you will benefit tremendously from incorporating this into your routine. Okay, final question of the week. Best lower back exercise to do at home? Well, there's two of them that I really like. One of them is the band, good morning. So take a band, and put it around your neck like this, okay? And then just 
do your regular good mornings. Get as deep as you possibly can. Try to get your face like really, really low. So band good mornings are probably my favorite. I also like band pull throughs. Those do wonders. In addition to walking outside with ankle weights, find yourself a good hill, okay? And walk up with the freaking ankle weights. Amazing stuff right there. And if you have access to something where you can lay down on, well, doing reverse hypers at home will benefit you tremendously. So those are my go-to movements at home. So with that said, hope you enjoyed this Q&A. Post more questions down below, and I'll talk to you all next week.